Good morning, everyone. So, um, as we all know, there's a new version of Erwin Data Modeler, version 9.8, and as uh, as we uh, know from Simon's quiz earlier on, no one's actually using it yet. So, um, I'm just this is a very brief introduction into what's new in that release. Okay. So this is a summary. So the um, one of the the uh, the big part of this is the uh, the new database abstraction layer. So this is a um, uh, a move to take some of the configuration of the forward and reverse engineering of, of databases out of the main database engine, uh, so that it'll be easier to keep track with changes to to DBMSs by being able to supply uh, those updates um, in a form that's external to the to the main um, to the main application. Um, other new things in the in terms of database support, we've got specific database support now native support for Hadoop Hive. Um, previously, you've needed to use the generic ODBC interface to connect to Hadoop Hive. Now there's uh, the specific support. There's also uh, specific support for um, Postgres. Um, this is the first implementation of the database abstraction layer. So we'll uh, talk more about that. Um, enhanced database support for SQL Server 2014-2016. So some of the new features uh, of 2014-2016, things like encryption and temporal tables, uh, are now supported in the tool. And we've also got some new database certifications. So the difference between this and the, um, uh, and the enhanced support, enhanced support is taking advantage of new features of the DBMS. The certifications are, are just to just where it's been proven that the existing tool set can connect to these these new new databases or the new versions of the databases. So there's no new feature support, but they uh, they will forward and reverse engineer at the previous feature level. Uh, another improvement is the uh, aggressive extermination of potential vulnerability issues. So we can see things like in the Mart, we've got the uh, the uh, implementation of strong passwords, um, and also a number of the third-party components have been upgraded. So some of the Microsoft components and the uh, uh, and the Apache components, later editions of those that have got uh, fewer of the uh, vulnerabilities that are reported against them. Uh, there are also a number of productiv uh, productivity enhancements. The highlighting of the keys involved in a relationship. So if you select a relationship on a diagram, then the parent and child key uh, uh, that participate in that relationship will be highlighted. Um, we've also got something that's, that many people have been asking for for a very long time, which is a, uh, a properties tab that includes the, the table create statement in the table editor. So that's been uh, that's been added. Um, unrestricted SA access for Mark viewers. That's um, uh, the, in previous releases. If you if you've got a read only. Uh, access into the mod. When you open a model and try to navigate through that model, so you try to change from one diagram to another one, one subject area to another, then you'll get a, a um, uh, what m many people consider a confusing or worrying message that says, do you want to detach this model from the mod? And there's nothing wrong with detaching the model from the mod because as a read-only uh, user, you can't save anything anyway. Um, but that that, um, that that message has been uh, has been removed, so that you can you can move through your uh, your models as a viewer without um, without being worried by 
by such uh, such messages. Uh, Mart improvements, uh, progress <coughs> bar added for the concurrent Mart save. Um, the improvements to LDAP support. So there's uh, some configurations of LDAP that weren't um, or that were, were troublesome in previous releases that, uh, that are now, now supported. And of course the um, uh, the new licensing mechanism that um, that was mentioned before. So we'll we'll go into that in some more detail. So this is a uh, this is a visual of that database abstraction layer. Um, so this uh, this nice representation of an engine there for the application engine. So currently that's where uh, the majority of the code sits for for forward and reverse engineering. So the abstraction layer. Uh, tries to take out as much of that as possible, certainly in terms of the uh, the configuration of the um, uh, the way that specific databases need to uh, to to use particular um, uh, particular properties of the of the database. So the the abstraction uh, abstraction layer applies to. Uh, databases that conform to the ANSI SQL standard, the 2008 standard. So all of the all of the properties that are supported by that standard uh, can be configured in a set of XML files that will then be read by the application. So the application will then know which properties to uh, uh, to um, uh, put on onto the uh, onto the table editors and uh, and such like. So the, the advantage of this is that all of these, these files being in, in XML files means that if there are a change, if there's new database, new data, database support, you can release that set of files rather than having to go through a new uh, release cycle of the, of the application itself. So it should mean that, um, that Erwin are able to support uh, changes to databases in a more uh, a more rapid fashion than, than was, per, than was pre previously possible, and you can see some of the some of the uh, the, the possible uh, target databases that um, that do support this standard that um, that are mentioned there. I say in 9.8, the first one that's been addressed is the is the Postgres. Uh, the next one that's coming along, is, I think Marty mentioned uh, Netezer. Redshift is also also. Uh, Underway, uh, but the others are uh, all possible. If you've got a particular favourite, then uh, then the more noise you make about it, the further it, it will get up the um, uh, the um, the chain in terms of uh, priority. So if you get onto the uh, idea wall in the Owen community and uh, and say what support you need, then I'm sure our friend at Owen will uh, will listen listen intently. This. No, no, it's all behind the scenes. Yeah, you don't, you, right. you don't, you don't need to know anything, uh, anything about this. Really. So, what difference does it make then if I'm using Postgres? I'm not, but what difference will make? I don't understand what difference it's going to make to me. Uh, it, the only difference it's going to make is in the release cycle. It's potentially going to mean that we can support uh, new, da new, da new databases, new releases of databases more quickly. More quickly. Okay. okay. Get yeah. It will come through. Yeah. 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 And if something like SQL Server, which is a bigger mission, I guess an Oracle as well, that means it's not going to have any impact at all. Um, well, there, there is there is some talk about um, about extending that to the to the big databases and make it more, but um, I don't yeah. I don't know any more about, about that. I don't know if if Martin uh, knows any more about that. Whether this um, this mechanism will apply more to the big databases as well. Yeah, I mean, eventually, yeah. So this is just part of the roadmap, really. So eventually, we'll be moving all of our databases to this. For, for DB2, SQL Server, Oracle, we're still doing natively. So it's a little bit slower to get things out for those. This is all about speed. Yeah. So this is an architecture underneath the covers. So it allows us to just release on a much quicker you know, release cycle because we've got less work to do. Martin, does this open up the possibility of having a developer SDK so that third parties can then exactly, develop yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So Teradata, for example, are one of our key partners. A big user of Urban DM. Yeah. And they're saying, look, we'll build it for you. Yeah. So. They know their product. Yeah. So this, yeah, this will be an API toolkit. And, and customers can do their own extensions as well. Thank you. So as well as the, the set of XML files, obviously the, there's also the FET files that many of you will be already familiar with. So that's what, what drives the, um, the DDL generation. There's a, there's also, there all, will also be a set of um, the reverse engineering queries. So that's the, the queries that are needed to extract the information from the, the relevant uh, DBMS uh, data dictionary. So, so that's what that's all, all of the set of uh, set of files in there. So anybody that does want to um, to develop their own uh, the, their own database support, then obviously they'll need that sort of knowledge to be able to to uh, to do the reverse engineering and forward engineering as well. Okay. Um, so uh, Hadoop Hive support, does anybody use Hadoop Hive at all? No? So I won't spend too much time on that because this won't mean much to many people. It's just a, the, um, it's just screenshots showing the, uh, the support for the, uh, for the um, specific properties on the tables and <coughs> columns on that. Actually, I'll say I'm not using it. Uh, we've recently been introduced to Hadoop and Hive with our now parent company, FedEx. And they use it quite a lot, so that's a, very, a lot of uh, interest to me. So if we could just do a little bit on it, that would be good. Well, it, it's only it's only really to say, to to show what the what the support is. So so there there are, it's just the specific properties under there. So if uh, so, just to show that it goes beyond the ge generic ODBC to to support the specific features of the um, uh, in the bu bucketing, partitioning uh, things in there. Um, and the uh, obviously the uh, the storage formats that that are supported. So so that's in 9.8. So that's in 9.8. That yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is the. Um, I can't see that one. Where are? So yeah, so this is the, the bucketing and, uh, and partitioning uh, section as well. So again, if you if you know about the about the way that um, Hadoop Hive handles all, all of that. Yeah, I was saying that was only just introduced to it the other yeah. day. Just, uh, creating um, external tables <coughs> over files and that kind of thing yeah. using Hive tables. So I think that would be of great interest. To Good. Community. Good. Uh, another another um, item support is the column statistics, so that you can get the stati statistics for the tables and columns. Um, this this is just to stress, as with other other statistics that that are supported in in the tool, you obviously need to run the the associated uh, statistics um, uh, jobs on the on the database to make that information available. Uh, once it's available, then obviously the, uh, the tool can, can pick it up. And this is a, uh, a similar view of the uh, of support for Postgres. So, so in this new abstraction layer, these property uh, property panels are driven by those external uh, XML files. So it, it says these are the these are the properties that we want to be supported for this database. So the, the tool can then pick that up and um, uh, format the the property panels appropriately for that. So in uh, the the new support for SQL Server is around um, the uh, encryption and masking. So the uh, uh, you can specify your encryption keys, store providers, uh, key paths. And Steve, what does 
that mean by um, always encrypted uh, well, I'm no SQL Server expert, so <laughs> all, all I can point out is that is that these things are, these things are supported. I don't know. I really don't know what the um, what what those features uh, mean. Does anybody else use those features in SQL Server encryption masking? No. Nope. So if you if you do have a need for it, then <laughs> it's there. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, specific. So you, you can you can add encryption to specific fields, and you can also mask uh, fields as well. So you, there's a there are um, functions for masking fields as well. And that's the um, uh, the extra DDL that's generated for the the encryption keys and. Um, uh, Values in there. The other, um, the other aspect of um, SQL Server that's now supported is temporal tables. So temporal, temporal options. Uh, so this was something that was missing from the initial support for uh, for 2016. So that's uh, that's now now supported. Uh, anybody use temporal tables in SQL Server? No. This is a graphic of the um, of the new um, key highlighting, key participation highlighting. So, so select relationship highlights the parent and child key in the uh, in the tables. You have the option of specifying the fonts and colours for the uh, uh, for the highlighting in there in the uh, in the default options as well. If it was a multi-column key, would it highlight all the columns? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Even if they're dispersed across the table. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the uh, the the long-awaited um, create table statement in the in the table editor. So this uh, this SQL is produced based on the current option set in the for forward engineering dialog. Yeah. So uh, so whatever your current your current forward engin engineering options are, that will be used to uh, to format this um, this create statement in the in the table <coughs> editor. Steve, what does that mean? When it says table guided, does that mean that you can modify that before you? Forward engineer it, or does it just say this is the this is the? Um, well, well, there are, there is you'll see a, an editor up there, so you, you can you can add it you can edit that, but not it doesn't it's not going to make any difference to to what you do in the forward engineering dialog. <coughs> so you could you can show it in the editor, so that you can cut and paste and amend it, and cut and paste it and use it directly from there. But it's not going to change anything on your. Uh, if you use it within forward engineering. So this just says this is a script it's going to create before you create. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you just want that one script, then you can just open the editor and um, uh, have a look at that, cut and paste that. <coughs> Which is useful. Yeah. It can be so annoying having to go through the forward. Yes. Just yeah. not the table DDL. <laughs> so yeah. Do you do the same with indexes and things as well, or is it just tables? Yeah, you don't want much, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking the box looks almost the same. Yeah. Be much different. Uh, yeah, at the moment it says only, uh, only on the tables. Okay. And it saved the changes, or that's what you get. No, that, that's this is generated from from the the, the current um, the current table properties and the um, and the option set. So. So there's nothing to save really. It's all generated. If you, as I say, if you want to open that in an editor and make changes, then you can you can do that. But it's not for saving. You can save that elsewhere. Does it show you all statements between this previous version and this version? Of no. <laughs> Got to ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
right licensing so this is the uh, probably one of the one of the, the main changes to the um, uh, to, uh, and you've already been through this I think, haven't I have. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. So, um, as nobody's on 9.8, you'll, you'll be aware that pre 9.8, the you basically had um, had two options for licensing. One is to obtain a license file that that ties your installation to um, to a specific machine uh, via the MAC address. Another one, another option would be to have the uh, uh, a concurrent license, which is downloaded from a license server, which is locally um, locally installed on the network. Um, which uh, some pe some people uh, found uh, rather clunky, especially in terms of moving licenses. If you if you've got a new PC or if. Uh, if you finish your job and somebody else wants to use your license, then uh, then swapping over licenses could be considered um, rather clunky. Uh, I must say that um, that we handle that in the office, so uh, so most of our customers are, have never found that particularly uh, particularly onerous uh, uh, process because we've uh, we've uh, smoothed that process out somewhat. But anyway, now we're, now there's more self-service involved in that because the uh, the licenses are th themselves are held held in the cloud so the um, uh, when you purchase your set of licenses you're purchasing a a number of activations um, and you can uh, you can for all of your installations you can activate and deactivate those installations at will at least in theory. How do you do that? Is that when you were uninstalled? Or is it sort of no, no, no. This is all, uh, it's all done through the internet. Okay, so it, it relies on an internet connection. Currently, uh, it's a very specific internet connection through port 80. So, as we've found, that's, there are quite a few places that, where that's is, not possible. Is looking at your MAC addresses? Uh, yes, well, it, it, it concocts. A, an identity for your machine and then uh, and then it, it activates uh, based on that on that identity so it involves it involves that it's just it's just an automated process rather than you having to look for specific information sending that off and getting something back then it's the you know the the application is doing that process for you uh, there are some some issues not uh, yeah 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 there are certain certain environments where there are there are issues yeah but we're we're working through them if you speak, do you have yeah. to remain connected to the internet once you've got the license no no once you once you're activated right. yeah. uh then uh, the, then you're okay but when you go through that activation you've got to make sure you're connected yes otherwise it doesn't work does it? yes yeah yeah you've got to be connected to get the activation in the first place When the license key came back, it didn't configure with my activation key um, for some reason. And it just became a nightmare. So after three days to get them. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you did get them in the end, did you? No, I no. got them in the end. Oh, right. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. You but should have. Work, yeah, it? yeah. Well, so, well, we'll, 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 yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pick that up with you when, when, when we get back to the office then. I, I did just, just assume, because you hadn't heard from me, that, that everything was. Well, um, I really wanted that to the high stuff, so. I'll yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's so look at that. The machine you've got going on doesn't have internet access. It says offline activation. Is yes, available. okay, yeah, so that's the next thing. If you, if you don't have uh, that online um, capability, then you need to um, basically, the, the, there's, a, um, uh, there's a button where you say do offline activation. And that gathers all of that uh, machine identity information uh, that you can then copy and paste into an email, send off to support. Support will then give you an act will send you back an activation key that you enter into the, into the interface, and then that will that will perform the the activation for you. 
<laughs> we'll get him working, don't worry. Um, because the, it's based on the adapter. The Mac is now added. Yeah. Well, if you if you've got yeah. Well, we can always get you a a, um, a, a license for the other adapter as well. So. Is there anything like common in that? Because I can go to other <coughs> Wi-Fi, might have some other. Well, if you once you move to to nine point eight, you shouldn't have that problem as long as you you've got connection to the internet. So, so on nine point eight, you should. It should. <laughs> okay. Okay. Is, there, just on the second, is there any motivation that you've got concurrent licenses to use this at all? Uh, yes. Uh, the, the concurrent licenses, uh, so you, you can use this m mechanism for concurrent licenses. So in effect, in that, in that situation, the, the license server is in the cloud. Yes, so you just get rid of the license server. You, you get, get rid of the license server, but you do need to have that connection to the internet for it to work yeah, 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 that's fine. okay and um, uh, the difference there when with it with a um, with, with a, a node lock license as soon as you've activated it's activated it, it, it downloads an activation key so so until you choose to deactivate it then then your installation is activated with concurrent licenses in the similar way to the to, to with the license server when you uh, terminate your session when you end your session log off then your license is automatically re returned returned to the cloud okay the one downside of, of concurrent licenses is that you can't do an offline activation there is no offline activation for concurrent licenses so so if you if you can't get the the standard mechanism to work then then it's uh, yeah so uh, so the the there are um, uh, the, there are going to be some some improvements uh, in the next the next few months, so that you can use proxy servers and things like that to uh, to get around having to use a specific port on the uh, on the internet. So so hopefully so there are one or two issues at the moment, but it's uh, they should all be sorted out pretty soon. Including if you've got a if you if you've got a dark site where there is, there is no um, no internet access at all. Um, there's going to be some some sort of solution for that as well. So we can install nine eight and nine seven on the same machine. No, together. you you can't install any two versions of a major release. So you can have uh, you can have uh, three, four, seven, eight, nine, all on the same machine, but you can't have any two nine point anythings on the same yeah, machine. Yeah, it will do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Why can't it do two versions? Uh just the way it installs. That, that's 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 why I don't I I don't know why Martin why why can't you have two versions of of nine there you go shares DLLs so the way it's built we're actually addressing we're actually addressing it now so we're actually looking at for the next version later Q4 yeah but lots of people want they want to install previous versions they want to have a test version they want to have so it's a slip looking yeah, because I mean, I, I tried to install it and it partially succeeded for a little while and then it bombed out. Because I wanted to see the foreign key highlighting, I was excited right. about that. And then it really spoiled the rest of my day. But <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was about for a full round. Kenneth. Being that you can come and use the licenses do not require a local on prem license server, does that mean it always requires an internet connection in order to validate? The, the concurrent, yes. Yeah, yeah. It always reaches, it always goes out to the yeah. central license server to say, give me a token. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay
Uh, yeah, so that's the um, that's all the all the differences really. So um, the 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 new version self service, uh, no need vendor in intervention is not required unless you have to do the offline activation. Uh, node lock licenses are easily moved between workstations and or users. So if you need to re if you need to return your license so somebody else could use it or so that you can use it on a different machine then you just deactivate it on that machine somebody else can pick up that license or you can pick it up on a different machine uh, that's just a um, screenshot of the licensing page the advantage is easier streamlined hopefully no. <laughs> okay. <coughs> no licensing delays, more flexible, enhanced administration, and it will apply to all of the, uh, of the products across the range. Would you have to use it? Oh, yes, there's no options. There is no, you can't use an older mechanism for, the, for licensing 9.8.